Today we're going to chat about blood gases. In order to do this, I've adapted a workshop that I prepared for SASOG a few years ago. The whole point is to illustrate the concepts with practical examples. Don't feel overwhelmed when you see a blood gas, especially if it looks confusing. Don't get tunnel vision and focus on the stuff that you don't understand or that doesn't make sense. Focus on the patient, resuscitate the patient, and not the blood gas. Much like anything in medicine, it's nice to have some kind of systematic approach. Context is vital when looking at a blood gas. Don't look at blood gases in isolation. Resize the patient and look after the patient clinically. That's your first priority. Use some sort of method, some sort of systematic approach, um, so that we can go through a blood gas um, in a step-by-step -step fashion. It can help to use memory aids if you're that kind of person. Maybe mnemonics, um, lists um, can sometimes help. Um, and also then having a differential diagnosis for when you look at the patient and the blood gas. There are a few things that we can look at when we have a blood gas. We can look at oxygenation and ventilation. We can talk about acid base. We can look at other parameters, so hemoglobin, electrolytes, and metabolites to give us some valuable information. And there's a whole bunch of other fancy stuff that we won't go into too much depth for. With regards to oxygenation, there are a few clinical clues that can tell us that the patient is hypoxic. Are they distressed? Do they appear oxygen hungry? Are they cyanosed? Are they confused? But we need to quantify the level of oxygen for our patients. So we look at some clinical parameters, pulse oximetry, PaO2, the PF ratio, and the AA gradient. Pulse oximetry done at the bedside um, is probably the easiest thing for us to do. So SATs of less than 92 to 94% tells us that the patient is hypoxic. If we've got access to a blood gas machine, which is obviously the whole point of this talk, we need to look at the PaO2, so the arteriolar concentration of oxygen. And if the patient is on room air and the PaO2 is less than 60, the patient has type 1 respiratory failure. We're going to chat about PF ratio, and I'm not going to focus a lot on AA gradient. PF ratio is a simple thing that we can do at the bedside. I really like it, um, and I encourage all of you to focus on this element of quantifying the hypoxia or the hypoxemia for the patient. So the PF ratio is the PaO2 over the FiO2. So it is the relation of the arterial concentration of oxygen uh, in relation to the amount of oxygen we are providing to the patient, so the fraction of inspired oxygen. So the FiO2 is expressed as a decimal. So if the oxygen concentration is 40%, the FiO2 is 0.4. If the oxygen concentration is 70%, the FiO2 is 0.7. Essentially, if we look at this blood gas that I've shown, the PaO2 is 76. If this patient does on room air, we wouldn't be concerned about the patient. However, if this patient is on a high concentration of oxygen, for example, a non-rebreather mask or even ventilated, we should be very concerned. It's not enough just to look at the PaO2 to tell us if the patient is hypoxemic. We need to know how much oxygen the patient is receiving to better quantify how hypoxic the patient is. So to illustrate this, I've done um, PF ratios with different concentrations. So uh, PF ratio on room air with an FiO2 of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and on 100% oxygen. You'll see if the patient is on room air, the PF ratio is very high, 361.9. If the patient is on a relatively high concentration of oxygen, so the 60% or the FiO2 of 0 0.6, you'll see this PF ratio is 126.6. That's really bad. That's a low PF ratio. That tells that this tells that that tells us that this patient is in trouble. As opposed to when the patient is on 80% of oxygen, so an FiO2 of 0.8, the PF is even worse, 95. This patient is in severe trouble. So you'll see how valuable a PF ratio is. You just need to know what the PaO2 is on the arterial blood gas, and we need to quantify how much oxygen is the patient receiving, and then we can calculate the PF ratio. This is a beautiful image of the European city of Berlin, and I've just put it in as a memory aid to help us remember the Berlin classification of ARDS. 
So on this slide, I've put up the Berlin definition of ARDS, and I don't necessarily need you to focus too much on the definitions, but just as a reminder, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, it's a life-threatening respiratory condition characterized by hypoxemia, very stiff lungs, and the patient is usually pretty sick. They usually require some kind of ventilatory and respiratory support. There's a number of different pathological conditions that can result in ARDS. For example, pneumonia, sepsis, polytrauma, massive transfusion, um, and severe ARDS will result in death without ventilatory support. You'll see there at the bottom, the severe ARDS has got quite a high mortality as opposed to the mild ARDS where it's not as high. Now, the reason I want you to know about the Berlin classification is because the Berlin definition of ARDS uses PF ratios to quantify and classify the level of hypoxemia. So a patient with a mildly reduced um, PA ratio, sorry, a PF ratio, where the PF ratio is 200 to 300, that patient has got mild ARDS. A patient who's got a PF ratio of 100 to 200, that's a moderate ARDS. A patient with a severe ARDS has a PF ratio of less than 100. In clinical practice, however, a patient who has got a PF ratio of less than 150 on oxygen, you need to be worried about. Um, that is a patient that we need to take decisive action. Some kind of ventilatory support might even require intubation and uh, mechanical ventilation. The AA gradient is a slightly more complicated way um, for assessing hypoxia. It's something that anaesthetists do and something that you'll do pretty much every single day if you work in an ICU setting. Um, so this should be done for our patients in high care. It helps us to narrow the differential for hypoxia. So if you have a patient who is hypoxic, this can help tell us what might be the cause of the hypoxia. A normal AA gradient is usually 10, and um, so it ranges from 5 to 10 for a non-smoking patient breathing room air. The normal AA gradient increases with age, and for every decade a patient has lived, their AA gradient is expected to increase by one millimeter of mercury. A conservative estimation for the normal AA gradient is age measured in years plus 10 divided by 4. The AA gradient is the alveolar minus the arterial gradient. In Johannesburg, we will use fairly standardized numbers to put into the equation, and the simplified equation is the one that I've shown at the bottom. A normal AA gradient, um, when the patient is hypoxic, points towards alveolar hypoventilation or a low inspired concentration of oxygen, for example, at high altitude. If the AA gradient is high, so if we have a high number, there's many reasons that the AA gradient can be high, but the most likely ones are being uh, a shunt is present or there is VQ mismatch. So how can I use the AA gradient for the same example? I have the same blood gas, the PaO2 is 76. Now I know that the patient is on an FiO2 of 0.65 and I've calculated the PF ratio, it's 116. This patient is in trouble, the PF is less than 150. We need to be doing something for this patient. How further can I quantify the possible cause of hypoxemia for this patient? Well, the PCO2 is not high, it's 26 on this gas. So I know that the patient doesn't have alveolar hypoventilation and I've gone ahead and calculated the AA gradient. It's 267.5, which is very high. This tells us that the patient is severely impaired and the most likely cause of it is the patient is shunting. This is a stunning photo of the Colosseum in Rome and I've included it as a memory aid for acid base. So the acid base mnemonic, Rome, Respiratory opposite, metabolic equal, is one of the things that you can use to point towards what is the primary disorder in acid base. This is my blood gas cheat sheet that I developed when I was in ICU. Um, it's a nice little cheat sheet to use for looking at acid-base disorders on blood gases. So there's a few simple steps that we need to do when looking at acid-base disorders. First of all, look at the pH. Um, is the pH down? Is there an acidemia? Is the pH up? Is there an alkalemia? 
try and decide what is the primary disorder using the room mnemonic to help you decide is there a respiratory condition, a metabolic con condition. Um, have a look at anion gap. We're pretty good at calculating anion gap when there is a metabolic acidosis, but don't forget that patients don't read textbooks. It's probably a good idea to always calculate an anion gap um, in case there is a mixed disorder because patients don't read textbooks and they don't usually just have one acid-base disorder. They usually have complicated acid-base disorders, not just a primary one. Uh, don't ever forget to look at base excess. It's a very valuable tool to tell us about metabolic acidosis. Have a look at compensation. Um, if there's a respiratory condition, usually there's metabolic compensation. If there's a metabolic condition, then there should be respiratory compensation. The amount of compensation determines the acuity or the duration of the condition. Mixed disorders, there's other fancy things that we can do. For example, looking at a delta gap and a delta ratio, um, particularly if there is a metabolic acidosis. We'll look at those, but go and have a look at life in the fast lane um, to get a little bit more information about those because that's how you decide um, if there really are significant uh, mixed disorders. The next section of the talk, I'm going through some practical examples to illustrate some of the conditions, particularly the acid-base conditions. So the first case is you get a phone call from a junior doctor and they're worried about a blood gas of a patient. So they send it to you via WhatsApp. This is the blood gas that you receive. We're going to look at oxygenation, ventilation, acid base and electrolytes and other. So there's a few important parameters that are missing. We don't have the temperature of the patient that's missing and it can affect the values on the blood gas. We do not know what the FiO2 is um, and we also don't know the altitude at which this blood gas was done. So was it done at Durban, at the coast or was it done um, in Joburg at altitude? First of all, oxygenation, the PO2 is 98.3. So we assume that the patient is okay, but this patient very well might be on supplemental oxygen. We don't know what the FiO2 is, so we can't calculate a PF ratio, and we don't know how, hypox how hypoxemic this patient is. Ventilation, the PCO2 is 23.6. The patient is obviously tachypneic, hyperventilating. With regards to acid base, the pH is 7.5, the PCO2 is down, so this is a respiratory alkalosis. The bicarb is fairly static, 22.5, so this is an acute respiratory acidosis. There's also a very slight, probably negligible metabolic acidosis if you see the base excess is minus 3.5, so it's only very slightly uh, low value. If we look at electrolytes, the ionized cal calcium is 0.88, which is very common when a patient is tachypneic. So most people will assume that a patient with respiratory alkalosis is hyperventilating. It's a dangerous assumption because there's many more life-threatening causes of respiratory alkalosis, particularly when it is in conjunction with hypoxemia. Amish is a nice memory aid to remembering the causes of respiratory alkalosis. While hyperventilation is one that we all remember, there are other causes of respiratory alkalosis. Anxiety, high ammonia levels, for example, in liver failure and severe anemia. Medications can also result in respiratory alkalosis. So for example, salicylate toxicity, catecholamines, so illicit ingestions of stimulants or patients that are on um, adrenaline or no adrenaline, as well as progesterone levels being high, so in pregnancy. Iron overdose, isonized can also cause uh, a respiratory alkalosis. Sepsis, including pneumonia, can cause it. Causes of hypoxia with hyperventilation that are life-threatening, pulmonary embolus, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary asthma. And although anxiety is right at the top, the life-threatening ones to remember are at the bottom of the slide. This is your next case. It's a 29-year-old female, GRAV2, PARA2, who's just delivered via Caesar for fetal distress. She had a GA for anesthetic indications. It was a term pregnancy at 38 weeks, and she's now in maternity high care post-extubation. This is the blood gas of the patient as she arrives in high care, and the nurses have settled her in. Um, you'll see they haven't recorded the temperature, which is bad. She's just come from theatre. She very well might be hypothermic. Uh, 
They have included the FiO2, which is good. We know the patient is receiving 40% oxygen supplementation via a face mask, most likely. Um, and they have included the barometric pressure. This is at sea level in Durban. So if we look at oxygenation, ventilation, acid base, electrolytes and other, we'll go through the gas like that. The oxygenation of the patient, the PO2 is 118, her PF ratio is 295, so slightly hypoxemic, but okay on her 40% oxygen. I calculated the AA gradient for you and it's 112. This is definitely abnormal for her age um, and can be a shunt related to uh, consolidation if she aspirated intraoperatively we'd have to have a good clinical exam and find out what happened intraoperatively or there could be atelectasis collapse um, secondary to the positioning and the general anesthetic. Her pH is 7.31 which is an acidosis and her PCO2 is 44. At term in pregnancy we would be expecting her PCO2 to be 30 maybe 35 so this is a respiratory acidosis. Looking at the level of the bicarb, it's fairly normal, maybe slightly low. It's pointing towards a respiratory acidosis. If I calculate the expected bicarb by going back to my cheat sheet, I did that, you'll see the expected bicarb is 24.4. If you look at the actual bicarb and the standardized base excess, you can see there's a mixed picture with a slight metabolic acidosis. She lost some blood, she required some fluid resuscitation intraoperatively. Her HB was 8.9, so maybe she's receiving a blood transfusion. When we're looking at metabolic, we do want the lactate so we can see how she is perfusing and giving us an indicator of um, how she's done intraoperatively. The glucose of 8 is expected. She's just had surgery. It is normal to have a metabolic response. So she has a respiratory acidosis, and it's acute. I'm going to go through now some of the things that cause respiratory acidosis. We can see the PaCO2 on a blood gas when we do an arterial stab. The level of carbon dioxide is related to the level of carbon dioxide production and alveolar ventilation. PaCO2 can be raised when there's increased CO2 production or decreased alveolar ventilation. The more important of these, as clinically there are so many causes, is alveolar ventilation. Just looking at some of the causes of CO2 production or retention, the patient might have malignant hypothermia, which increases CO2 production, or they might be re-breathing, for example, intraoperatively, if the anaesthetist forgot to change the soda lime. This is slightly more rare. The, the next part that I'm talking to you is about alveolar hyperventilation and is much more common. I like to think of the causes of alveolar hyperventilation like the layers of an onion. So like the layers of a person going from outside inwards, there's numerous causes of alveolar hyperventilation. And my onion is my memory aid for helping you remember these. So there are many causes of alveolar hyperventilation, many clinical conditions that can, that can affect ventilation. Extrapulmonary disease or thoracic disorders like scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis or a flail chest. Impaired lung function or pleural interruption, so for example a pneumothorax or a massive hemothorax or even if there's fibrosis, impairing normal lung function. Neuromuscular disease, for example Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, various neuropathies or myopathies, or pulmonary or parenchymal disease, for example pneumonia. Lower airway obstruction can cause alveolar hyperventilation, for example, secondary to bronchospasm or mucus plugs. Upper airway obstruction can cause alveolar hyperventilation. The tongue is the big culprit, especially if we're not managing the airway and the tongue flops back in the mouth and obstructs the airway. There could be a foreign body. There might be spinal cord reasons for the patient having alveolar hyperventilation, for example, penetrating or blunt injuries. There can be central causes for alveolar hyperventilation, for example, head injuries, meningitis, respiratory center depression, sedatives, opioid analgesics. So there's a long list and many different things that can cause alveolar hyperventilation. We need to look at the patient in context to try and decide what is the cause of their respiratory acidosis. This is your third case. You have a comserve doctor who has called you to come and see the patient in maternity high care. 
it is a 25 year old lady with skeletal dysplasia that has been referred to you from another another facility for further management it's a planned pregnancy she is 30 weeks gestation she's previously had two miscarriages and has had hip surgery in her youth on both hips she recently had a cold and upper respiratory tract infection that was managed symptomatically um, a few days ago. He brings this blood gas to you and is worried, thinking he has to intubate the patient. So just some of the important points. The temperature of the patient is included. The temperature is 37.4. She's obviously pyrexial. Um, and I wonder how this temperature was done. Was it done axillary? Was it core? Was it tympanic? Was it just a skin thing? So this patient has had a fever, 37.4 sounds normal, but if it's a skin one, you can probably assume the temperature is higher. Good, they've included the FiO2, so she's on 40% oxygen, and we've got the barometric pressure, so the patient is at altitude in Johannesburg. If we look at oxygenation, the PO2 is 69, so it's sort of low, especially considering we're administering 40% oxygen. If we calculate the PF ratio, it's 172.5, so the lady's in trouble. The AA gradient is also elevated. There's probably a reason for the shunt. Does she have acute lung pathology secondary to her skeletal dysplasia? Does she now have a pneumonia from her upper respiratory tract infection? Um, with regards to acid base, the pH is 7.3. The PCO2 is high, so she's got a respiratory acidosis. The bicarb is elevated, so this tells us that it is a chronic respiratory acidosis. And I used my cheat sheet. To look at how to calculate the expected CO2 and it's 30.8 which is pretty similar to the bicarb that is um, on the gas. So she has a chronic respiratory acidosis. With regards to her electrolytes, electrolytes are all looking okay, lactate, glucose, hemoglobin, all of those are fairly all right. The base excess is minus five, so this tells us there's also a concomitant metabolic acidosis, um, but it is not a huge portion of her acidosis. So we've already diagnosed that it's a chronic respiratory acidosis, and when we go through to see her, we're not surprised why her gas looks like it does. When you see the patient in high care, it's very obvious as to the cause of her gas. She's short, she's got significant kyphoscoliosis causing a COPD, and this is the cause of her chronic respiratory acidosis. You tell your junior doc that there's no intubation, no need for intubation right now. Her GCS is 15 out of 15. She's well compensated. Um, the hypoxemia and hypercarbia could be due to her underlying chronic restrictive lung disease, but we need to be worried about a pneumonia, especially with the shunt. She's got a temperature, there's a little bit of a metabolic acidosis, so we need a new chest x-ray, obviously, to investigate and probably inflammatory markers as well. Just remembering uh, the onion as the memory aid for... Uh, respiratory acidosis. There's many different layers and many different causes of alveolar hypoventilation. I've given you an example of, of an acute and of a chronic respiratory acidosis. I'm going to move on to talking about some compensation. The 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 rule or the 1, 2, bicarb, 4, 5 rule is a really cool way of remembering compensation for respiratory conditions. If you look on life in the fast lane, it'll take you through this. But it essentially describes the compensatory memory aid used for respiratory conditions. It describes the expected movement of bicarb in relation to the movement of CO2. An increase in bicarb is found in respiratory acidosis. A slight increase in bicarb is found in acute respiratory acidosis, whereas a large increase in bicarb implies a chronic respiratory acidosis. A decrease in bicarb is found in respiratory alkalosis. A slight decrease in bicarb implies an acute respiratory alkalosis, whereas a large decrease in bicarb implies a chronic respiratory alkalosis. The next patient is a 22-year-old female patient. The emergency department doctor has called you to come and see the patient. He thinks that she has a ruptured ectopic. She has a gestation of eight to nine weeks pregnancy, based on dates, and she confirmed an over-the-counter pregnancy test at home. They've confirmed a positive beta-HCG in the ED. 
She has severe abdominal pain, no history of severe PV bleeding, some spotting a few days ago. She's pale, tachycardic, and hypotensive. The emergency department doctor has administered a liter of crystalloid fluid. He's putting up a second line. She's received fentanyl, 50 micrograms, some profalgin, and it's, he's preparing to give a two uh, milligram dose of morphine for analgesia. So this is her gas that was pulled. Um, you can see they've included her temperature. She's slightly hypothermic, probably needs her fluids to be warmed, blankets and a bear hugger. They have included the barometric pressure, so it's obviously at sea level in Port Elizabeth, and they have included the FiO2. She's on 60% oxygen. So if we look at oxygenation, her PO2 is 237 on 40% oxygen. This is hyperoxia. We can probably turn the oxygen down to a 40% mask or even a nasal cannula. With regards to ventilation, you can see the CO2 is 28. She's tachypneic. With regards to blood gas, if we're looking at acid base, her pH is 7.13 and her PCO2 is down. So this is a metabolic acidosis. Um, we can also see by the bicarb that it is very low that this is a metabolic acidosis and the standardized base excess of minus 13 tells us exactly the same thing. Um, we can now we're able to calculate an anion gap. And I'm, we're going to talk, that, talk about that just now because we've got all of the electrolytes. If we're looking at the ionized calcium, it is low. This is something that we potentially could uh, work on if her blood pressure was low. You can see the glucose is elevated. It's probably a stress response. Um, and her lactate is very high. She definitely needs further resuscitation. So there's no surprise when we decide that this is a metabolic acidosis. But it is also a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. To remind us what the anion gap is, I've put up the formula on the next screen. Anion gap is the sodium minus the chloride minus the bicarb. A high level is when it is above 16 to 20. You might have a slightly different value if you are including potassium in your anion gap calculation. When there is a metabolic acidosis, we need to decide, is it a high anion gap, a normal anion gap, or a low anion gap metabolic acidosis? Paracetamol overdose, peraldehyde, which we don't see much in clinical practice, iron overdose, isoniazid overdose, lactic acidosis, ethylene glycol, salicylate sepsis, methanol, so toxic alcohols, uremia, renal failure, and DKA are all causes of a HAGMA, a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Winter's formula is the most important compensatory formula to remember. If you don't remember any of the others, don't worry about it. This is the one to recollect. So Winter's formula is used for compensation, predicting compensation for metabolic acidosis, expected PaCO2, 1.5 times by bicarb plus 8, so within 2, either up or down by 2. If you find that the CO2, the expected CO2 that we've calculated, is pretty much the same as the measured, then we know there's adequate compensation. If the expected PaCO2 is different from the measured, then we know that there's a concomitant metabolic condition. The last two cases, I'm going to focus more on the acid base rather than on the oxygenation and ventilation. This patient is a 72-year-old patient who is referred for admission from GOPD. She is seen by the intern. She is a lady who has CA cervix that has been lost to follow up for the last two years. She was following it up at a different facility but has come to live with her daughter. She's now presenting with lower abdominal pain, some PV discharge that is offensive. Um, she's had significant weight loss and has severe fatigue with some mild nausea. This is the blood gas for the patient. Her temperature is 37.9, which is not a surprise for you. You do think that she has an element of infection slash sepsis. She apparently is on room air as the FiO2 is 0.21. She is at the coast, so it is possible that the PO2 is higher, but likelihood is she's on some supplemental oxygen. You notice that um, her CO2 is 25, so she is tachypneic. So she's uh, tachypneic as a result of her metabolic condition. Her pH is 7.3, PCO2 is down, so she's a metabolic acidosis.
Um, her anion gap is 18, as you went ahead and calculated it. So it's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. We want to look at the compensation. The PCO2, when you calculate the Winters formula, it's 26, and the actual PCO2 is 25. So she's well compensated for her metabolic acidosis. The base excess is minus 11, which also goes with a metabolic acidosis. So she is probably requiring fluid resuscitation. You do notice that her lactate, however, is not high. So you're not that worried about perfusion. Her HB is low, and it is probably an HB of chronicity. Um, as part of the investigation that was done by your intern in GOPD, you are lucky enough to have some ISTAT values and you notice that her urea and creatinine are significantly elevated. So although she might be dehydrated as a cause of her metabolic acidosis, actually she has a significant uremia as a cause of her severe metabolic acidosis. When you're doing a little bit more reading, you need to have a look at this particular cheat sheet um, on my um, cheat sheet for acid-based disorders. Mm -hmm. And it goes through how to differentiate between a HAGMA, so a high anion gap metabolic acidosis, a NAGMA, a normal metabolic, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, as well as looking at a lower anion gap metabolic acidosis. This is probably quite an advanced topic and it is a topic for another stage, but I'm going to recommend that you guys go and have a look on Life in the Fast Lane to take you through delta gap and delta-delta ratio. Your last case is a young lady who is referred to you for admission from GOPD. She's a young lady in early pregnancy presenting with the diagnosis of hyperemesis gravidarum. The doc has run a blood gas in the neighboring antenatal unit and shows you the blood gas on admission. This is a great blood gas because the temperature is included. She's apyrexial. She's on room A and they have included the barometric pressure. She's at Bloemfontein. Her PaO2 on room A is 83, so she is not hypoxemic. I'm not going to go ahead and calculate a PF ratio and an AA gradient, so I do not think that it is necessary for this patient. Moving on to acid base and electrolytes, this is where the majority of this problem is at this case. You'll see her pH is 7.5 and her PCO2 is 49. So the pH and the CO2 are moving in the same direction. So this is a metabolic condition. Based on the bicarb, her PCO2 and her pH, you can tell that it is a metabolic alkalosis. People assume that a metabolic alkalosis is from the loss of hydrogen ions. That is how we explain it. However, if you look at this gas, you can see that the chloride is low. It is 89. She is vomiting large volumes of chloride from her stomach acid. She's got a severe metabolic acidosis as a result of a hypochloremia. This is why her gas looks so abnormal. The standardized base excess is 11 when you would expect somebody that was hypovolemic to have a significantly low base excess, which can be found, it is true. But she has got such severe retching and such severe vomiting, her standardized base excess is actually positive. Metabolic alkalosis can be one of the more confusing conditions to understand, which is why a memory aid comes in handy when trying to remember the causes of metabolic alkalosis. Clever PD is the mnemonic which can help us remember the causes of metabolic alkalosis. Contraction or dehydration, laxative abuse or patients who use licorice because it's a significant diuretic, various endocrine causes, for example, Cushing's and Conn's, Severe vomiting, for example, this patient, somebody who's got a pyloric stenosis, um, or for example, this young lady who has a hyperemesis, GIT losses. And the reason is, is because we're using, losing chloride. If we have a patient who's had um, excess alkali administered, um, iatrogenically, so antacids or citrate, or by the patient themselves, um, it can also result in a metabolic alkalosis. Renal causes... Barters and severe um, sodium depletion are much more difficult to understand, but don't forget about them. A patient who's recovering from a post-hypercapnia will develop a metabolic alkalosis in the recovery phase. So patients who've had COPD and have been treated and are maybe in the recovery phase after their pneumonia, 
um, you will see this. And patients receiving diuretics. So metabolic alkalosis is probably one of the more difficult um, acid-base conditions to understand. And I find that using a memory aid is helpful. The traditional way that we understand acid-base disorders is according to the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. So we look at pH, we look at PCO2, and we look at bicarb. The Henderson-Hasselbach equation includes bicarb and hydrogen ions. But we do need to admit that there are other variables that are not included when looking at acid-base. The strong ion theory developed by Dr. Stewart is a theory of acid base that is a mathematical model, also known as a physico-chemical model of acid base. And Dr. Stewart's theory states that many factors affect pH, not just the same ones that we learned in Hendelson Hasselbach theory. So the strong iron theory says that pH is affected by PCO2, weak acids and bases, buffers not considered in the traditional Hendelson Hasselbach model of acid base, and the strong iron gap. The strong iron difference is essentially the sodium minus the chloride. So coming back to our young lady with the severe hyperemesis gravidarum, she has a severe significant metabolic alkalosis. The Henderson-Hasselbach model explains the metabolic alkalosis is caused from the loss of hydrogen ions in her vomiting. The Stewart strong iron theory is another way of understanding this. Her sodium is normal, but her chloride is very low. In order to maintain electrical neutrality in our blood, all of the anions and cations have to be balanced. The cations in the blood mainly are sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and hydrogen ions. But the main cation contributing to the charge in our blood is sodium. The anions in the blood are mainly chloride, bicarb, hydroxyl ions, sulfate ions, negatively charged proteins, mainly albumin, sulfate ions and the strong ion gap. However, the most important anion contributing the charge in our blood is chloride. The strong ions are therefore mainly sodium and chloride. The strong ion difference is sodium minus chloride. A normal strong ion difference is usually between 25 and 35 or 30 to 40 depending on what text you read. This young lady has vomited a large volume losing many chloride ions. In order to maintain electron neutrality, the bicarb component in her blood has expanded. The strong iron difference has also increased. It is now 46. When the strong iron difference increases, this is in keeping with a metabolic alkalosis. As this patient is losing a large volume of chloride ions, this is a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Stewart's theory also helps us understand what happens when we administer large volumes of normal saline to a patient. Please remember that normal saline is not normal at all. There are 154 millimoles per liter of sodium and 154 millimoles per liter of chloride in normal saline, or 0.9% sodium chloride. It should probably be called abnormal saline. One liter used for a resuscitation in an emergency is probably okay, However, many liters being administered um, can lead to problems. There have been studies that show multiple liters of normal saline administered to healthy patients can result in metabolic acidosis. So if this was our starting point with a normal distribution of ions, ions in the blood and a normal strong iron difference, this is how the blood would look after administering administering large volumes of fluid with a high chloride content. Here you can see the strong iron difference is decreased and the bicarb component has contracted. The strong iron difference is 15. This results in a metabolic acidosis. So when the strong iron difference is decreased, there's a metabolic acidosis. So our imaginary patient will have a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. This can happen very often when we've got a patient recovering from DKA. The glucose is starting to normalize, the ketones have settled, but our patient still remains acidemic and we might not be able to explain 
it by an uh, ongoing DKA, as the DKA itself seems to be improving. It could be from the injudicious use of normal saline throughout the resuscitation of the patient with DKA. It's always preferable to use, to use a balanced solution intravenously, like Balsol, which is called Plasmalite, or Ringer's Lactate. This is just a slide with a reminder of the compensation formulae. I have included it in my uh, blood gas cheat sheet. The most important compensation rule is probably Winter's formula, and we use it in metabolic acidosis. The whole point of figuring out the compensation rules is to decide if there's another concomitant primary acid base condition. As we chatted about earlier, it also gives us a clue as to the chronicity of the acid base condition. So this is a fantastic poster that I love, ABG, easy as one, two, three, that you can download off the internet. It's free. Um, you can laminate it, I do, and put it near the blood gas machine so that I can remember my blood gas stuff, my juniors can remember, and anybody that's standing there waiting to get the blood gas result can have a little bit of an education. So I like this poster because it not only takes you through how to read a blood gas and to interpret the acid base basis, it also discusses other stuff that is often forgotten on the blood gas. So looking at the oxygen tension, the fraction of methemoglobin, the fraction of carboxyhemoglobin, the shunt, and hematocrit, all fantastic stuff um, for us not to forget about on blood gas. So in summary, when looking at blood gas, let's look at the context. Obviously, resuscitate the patient rather than calculating and doing mathematical calculations. Have a systematic approach, so look at oxygenation, ventilation, look at blood gas, look at electrolytes, other values, other parameters. Um, try and remember some of the memory aids, and then have a good differential diagnosis for what you're looking at. Thank you for listening to this talk on an approach to blood gases. I hope it was useful.